if I told you you could have a comic with Mace Windu, Asajj Ventress, Rex, and Jar Jar Binks, but it worked, would you take me up on it? I hope you do because Age of Republic special. We're talking about it right now here on Beyond the Panel. Episode 2 of Beyond the Panel. Thank you so much for joining me, David, with Beyond the Blast Doors. This here is my second show on uh, the YouTube channel. This is going to be a show specifically just for Star Wars comics. I'm really excited about it. I know that so many people who follow us, who interact with us, they say that we, you know, they love the Star Wars comics, uh, but they either can't keep up with it or they want us to do more talk about the comics because they're so invested in it. So I thought, you know what, let's do this show. So I've done one episode before. It was a little while ago. My goal for right now is to be more consistent. So every Thursday night, 6 p.m. Central, I'm going to drop an episode of Beyond the Panel. What I'd like to grow this into is something to where I can have folks from, uh, there's so many people on YouTube that, that know so much about the comics, bring them on. And then if the show gains the traction and it's worth the time, I'd like to have you know Marvel writers and inkers and colorists come on the show too and give us that industry perspective. I think that could be really valuable and really fun to have those uh, people part of the conversation. But for right now, like I said, I need to do my part and just be consistent getting this show out there, making sure people know to check out the channel 6 p.m. Thursday nights for Beyond the Panel. So as I mentioned, Age of Republic special, really fun, great time, love the comic. Uh, we'll talk about that. Also, StarWars.com dropped uh, within the last 24 hours our first look at Age of Rebellion. Uh, there's four comic book covers, I believe, there. We'll check those out as well and uh, give you a quick breakdown of each book, what each book will be angled at. I think I'm most excited about the Grand Moff Tarkin. And then we'll wrap this whole thing up, uh, kind of like how we do on the live show every Sunday. Uh, we will show you and tell you about the comics coming out next week. So you come here, we talk about this week, any of breaking news, and then we throw it to what's in the future, what's in the store. So if this is your first time watching Beyond the Panel, let me know right now in the comments below, do you like this idea? Do you like having about a 10 to 25-minute show that is solely focused on Star Wars comics? Let me know down in the comments below. I would love to know what you think. Now, before we get uh, started in the first comic book, I want to shout out two friends of the show, uh, James Earl Jones and Kelly Marie Tran. Uh, I've been told uh, by sources that they watch every week, and uh, it is their birthday. So on a serious note, I want to say happy birthday to James Earl Jones and Kelly Marie Tran, two actors, well, an actor and an actress, uh, who've made profound impacts on the movies. Excited to see what Kelly does with uh, Rose in Episode Nine. Of course, you can't deny James Earl Jones' influence on not just Star Wars, but like movie cinema, like all time. Like he'll always be remembered. Um, but I want to say a sincere happy birthday to the both of them. Okay, so now I do want to say that uh, we have the one comic. We got four comics uh, to talk about. We have five, six comics to talk about. This is fun because we're talking about the comics of today. Uh, in the future, and then next week. So let's go ahead and get started right now with uh, Age of Republic special. This is number one. Mace Windu sabotages a terrorist group. This is an insane story, and I loved it from beginning to be beginning. Ethan Sachs writes it. Paolo uh, Villanelli is the artist, and Eric Arcaniga is the color artist. So I, I hope I got those names pronounced correctly, um, but I love your work. So forgive me. If I, if I said your name wrong, please let me know how uh, to say it. Uh, and I say that because I tagged them all in my, like, congratulations tweet yesterday. I was like, you guys made the best comic ever. Uh, and they saw that. So if they end up watching this, I want them to know that I'm sorry, but uh, just correct me. And I'll never make a mistake again. Uh, that's, that's not true. Uh, hey, so let's actually talk about this comic. So we're on this planet, Oslan. It's in the Outer Rim Territories. And uh, we first see a Jedi sweep of a planet go by and nothing really happens. And then we find out that these terrorists have Mace Windu. And they're taking him to their leader, which is kind of terrifying. It's this dude... I don't know if he looks like a Game of Thrones kind of character, but he definitely looks threatening, and he has Mace Windu's lightsaber in different pieces. And I'm like, oh, man, that's a problem. Like, they disassembled they disassembled Mace's lightsaber. That's, that's a problem. Then we get, like, this flashback, um, how basically Mace Windu is, like, being, like, told, like, oh, you don't, you know, you're not going to get out of this. And he goes back to this flashback with his master where he's, like, assembling the lightsaber. And then we start to learn how, like, the Force connects the pieces of the saber like the saber is not really meant to be held together but it's the force that binds that and then we had like this little duel with mace windu taking down the terrorist um and then out of nowhere the the rest of these jedi swoop in and they're able to to get mace windu free and qui-gon jinn actually makes an appearance at that last panel but i didn't want to show that because i felt like that was like 
then I'm just showing you the entire comic book. Like, you still need to be able to go out there and, and get this comic and flip through it for yourself. Um, of course, if you already have, then I guess I'm, I'm, I'm keeping you from enjoying that, that panel one more time. But I think it's really interesting because, you know, I go back to the beginning, that girl with the purple skin, you know, uh, Mace calls her a young terrorist. She goes, I'm a freedom fighter. You know, I, I think that's interesting, that perspective. I really did feel like this was like, I wonder if there was like a story from the Iraq War or Afghanistan that they just like molded and, and just threw in Star Wars characters because it, it felt oddly relatable. But uh, Gutako the Grim is this main villain in this comic book, and he has, you know, this ch army of children. And uh, I don't know, it's just very interesting, uh, the conflict there between Mace and these kids and it's like why would mace windu allow himself to just be captured by these kid freedom fighters or terrorists as he calls them and it comes down like it's all part of the plan because he's leading the jedi to where these uh where this army is based out of because you know as this overlord whatever we want to call him explains there's so many caverns on this planet that it would take a century or more for the jedi to find mace windu's dead body but Mace has the beacon, and they're tracking him, so the Jedi know exactly where to go. I mean, it's just, it's just very, like, yeah, that's how that would happen, uh, and it worked for me. But I really am fascinated with this concept of how the Force binds the pieces of the lightsaber. And you see Mace Windu's uh, hilt, you know, kind of, like, shattered. Uh, the pieces aren't broken. They're just, it's just disassembled. Um, and, and I'm just kind of fascinated by that. I think lightsaber lore is one of the more interesting elements of Star Wars just because it used to be that, you know, the crystal chose the, the, the Jedi, and that's still kind of the truth, but, you know, the Jedi now determines the color of the blade, which it used to be like you'd walk into a cave on Elam and you'd be like, oh, here's a green blade, you know, here's a green crystal that's calling to me, I'm going to use that as my lightsaber. Well, that's not how it works now. Now it's like you find the crystal, it calls to you, and then you, like, inject your force energy into it and you try and and it becomes either blue or green or whatever color that comes out, you know? So, um, yeah, I want to look at this flashback, too. Cause, so it's, it's funny because they're, like, without a working laser sword. So, like, that's, like, a George Lucas reference. That's, you know, uh, what, what uh, they had Luke say in Episode Eight, right? Um, but, you know, here it is. Mace Windu's told, like, he's powerless to save himself. And then we go, you know, we're starting to see these panels. They keep cutting back to the close-up of the lightsaber, and it's assembling. And I just think that is so fascinating. I want to look at the um, flash, the flashback. He's talking to his master, Hyung, and he's like, I'm never going to be able to build my lightsaber. And he, the master's like, well, the master through the droid is like, you know, patience. You know, the secret is that the pieces never needed to be built. It's the force that binds them together through you. That makes you the weapon. And then you see Mace assemble the lightsaber, and then you go back to present time. The lightsaber is assembled, ignited, flying towards Mace, and this battle ensues. And what I love about that is I like to think of Mace Windu as the weapon. Uh, I, like, I like the idea that he is the weapon because we always talk about how Mace Windu was influenced by the dark side in his fighting style. You know, and then, you know, you had the book Shatterpoint, which unfortunately isn't, um, you know, canon anymore. But I really dig this idea. Even from a very young age, Mace Windu views, him, views himself for good reason as the weapon itself. And he, he, the weapon, wields the saber. And it was really fun to see that um, skirmish. I won't call it a battle. It was more of a skirmish play out in the comic books. So first story, right off the bat, really enjoyable. I want to now just dive into uh, Asajj Ventress, but before I do, I want to make sure that you know that you should really comment down below. Did you like what you see with that Mace Windu story? You think you'll read it if you haven't already? Or what was your favorite part? Did I miss something? I want you to let me know in the comments below. If you want to just tell me, like, hey, David, stop hitting your microphone with your mouth, you can do that, too. That's totally fine. I won't, I won't be offended. Asajj Ventress has the next story in this comic book, and it starts with the bounty on Ahsoka, Tano. So my assumption is this comic is happening uh, during the Clone Wars series, right? Because we obviously know how the series kind of ends with like um, Ahsoka being chased down by the Jedi and uh, Ventress, and she ends up leaving the Order, right? Because uh, Palpatine has this plan. Anyways, so uh, on her way to try and track down Ahsoka Tano, she comes across this dude who is attacking these two young women. And she's like, it's not my problem, figure it out. But then she's like, but I remember. I remember what it was like to be alone, by myself, vulnerable, having to defend for myself on the streets. And uh, 
you know, then she reflects back. You know, she has her family, the Night Sisters, having her, you know, you know, her whole family killed by Grievous. You know, it's just you kind of forget how much Ventress has been through in this story. And it makes me so happy that they brought this character that died in the first half of that micro Clone Wars series. It's so fun how they really expanded her role in the Star Wars canon uh, through Clone Wars. And, of course, this comic is a really great compliment to the character. Uh, she ends up chopping this guy's arm off, and the two girls get away, which is really, uh, you know, that's a feel-good story. My thing with Asajj Ventress is just, like, where does that decision to do good come from? Because I think that Asajj, after she gets abandoned by Dooku, and in case you didn't know in the Clone Wars, what happens is... Um, Dooku basically uh, betrays Asajj Ventress because he's told to by Palpatine. And so then he ends up getting another apprentice, which is Savage Opress, which ends up being a double agent for Ventress. I mean, it, it's just crazy how it, you know, it keeps going around in circles. And so uh, what, I, it, what I wonder here is, you know, she saves these girls, I think, legitimately because she empathizes with them because of the struggle that she had on the streets. But is Asajj Ventress really capable of doing good? And I think it's good from a certain point of view, right? Right. That's Star Wars cliche. But I think in most case, I, I think I think in most cases, it still is all about Asajj and, and how it benefits her. Of course, we get a better look at Asajj Ventress as well in the Dark Disciples novel, where she uh, has that love uh, interest uh, a guy by the name of Quinlan Vos. Not sure if you heard about him. He's he's kind of like one of the coolest, most fascinating Jedi that we just have not explored yet. I'd, I'd say, like, Sifo-Dyas and Quinlan Voss need the most exploration as soon as possible. But, again, second short story here of uh, Star Wars Age of Republic special for 2019. I think it works. I love the art. I think uh, this book uh, has a lot of successes, and I think the Star Wars, the second story titled Sisters, is really a success. Jody Hauser wrote it, Carlos Gomez, the artist, and Dono Sanchez Almara uh, were, was the color artist on this and uh, really, really enjoy it. And I guess I should have gone ahead and read uh, the brief description they provide in the comic book. After narrowly surviving Count Dooku's betrayal and the destruction of her people by the Separatists, the fearsome Asajj Ventress is for forging her new path. She may no longer be a dark apprentice, but she's as deadly and as determined as ever. So um, I'll do... I should have read the Mace Windu, but now I'm looking at both of them. I said all this stuff. I know what I'm talking about. I'm a trusted source. Anyways, the third uh, part of this comic, and I just I love this comic book, and I hope you do too. Make sure in the comments you let me know what you liked or maybe what you didn't like about this Asajj Ventress story, Sisters. But you know what worked for me? Captain Rex and Jar Jar Binks. This is, 50, this is called 501 Plus One, and this is Rex. He's leading his soldiers in a battle against the Separatists. And uh, somehow Jar Jar Binks becomes the most valuable uh, ally. You have uh, Mark Guggenheim as the writer, Casper Winogard as the artist, and Chris Peter as the color artist. I think VC's Travis Lanham here is credited as the letterer. And I love the look of the battle. I mean, it's like kind of like an old school art style for the, the comic. Like I feel like this is almost like a dark horse comic that I'm reading. It's really gritty. I like that. So that captures the, the spirit of battle. And uh, I just, anytime you can see clones shooting droids, like, it's a good time. But I'm also, like, um, I don't know, I've been called a prequelist. Um, oh, yeah, Jar Jar uses the lightsaber. I didn't get to that point soon enough. But basically what happens is uh, Jar Jar finds this lightsaber um, and, and, and saves the day in a way. Because what happens is there's this battle. Rex gets injured. Um, they're all, this is the part of the Battle of Mimbin, right? So uh, they're having this battle. Jedi have to fall back. Jedi dies. Uh, they're all in retreat. They go back to their base, and Rex is like, I'm going to go by myself to capture this space because I can't risk any more lives. Well, Jar Jar steals the lightsaber. Well, he doesn't steal. I mean, he takes it because uh, <laughs> Jedi Lantic dies in an explosion, right? So um, Jar Jar has this lightsaber and waves it around and slices a couple of droids that he's able to save Rex as he's out on this solo trip. I mean, you're looking at the, the previous panels right now where the battle is actually ensuing. And, and, and just like Jar Jar has this way, and I think it's the writing, a lot of it, this has to do with the writing, you know, puts him just randomly in the battle. Like, Jar Jar being in the battle does not make any sense. It makes, to me, no sense that he would be there. I get it that he's like this political guy, and, you know, he might be a negotiator. But you would think that after the years and years, you would stop sending Jar Jar Binks to do the negotiations for the Republic. That's just me. 
So anyway, we're seeing like clones, you know, torn apart here by uh, the droids. Rex comes through on the solo mission. He gets cornered by these droids. Jar Jar swoops in, saves the day, uh, slices two droids with the saber, and then it's too slippery for him. So like that traditional Jar Jar commentary uh, comes back. But uh, Jar Jar and Rex come in and uh, actually take over. You know, they defeat these droids and uh, take over the base. And so, uh, you know, it's it's a happy ending. Well, I guess we can't say they take over the base, but they actually go and, and battle. It's a single shot. You know, it, it ends there. Like, you just don't know what's next. But, um, oh, this does remind me, though, that Anakin Skywalker, Count Dooku, Padme Amidala, uh, and I think Grievous, they all have single shots coming as well here in this Age of Republic line. We'll, we'll flash those up one more time in just the near future. But uh, overall, really dig all three of these books. I do want to remind you that at the end of each of these comics, they always have, like, a great write-up that's kind of in... Um, Kind of gives you the background to the story that happens inside. And uh, Glenn Greenberg does a really nice write-up on Asajj, Mace Windu, Captain Rex. Like, it's really interesting. There's, like, concept art that he shares in there. So be sure to go ahead and uh, check that out. And I, w- I just want to know if you dig this way that Marvel, Marvel Star Wars is telling these stories where it's a series of, like, 20, 29 comics each comic focuses on someone else. Uh, aside, you know, even the specials. I mean, the specials were three different stories, but they were three unique different stories for three unique different characters. Well, four when you throw in Jar Jar there. Uh, five, it was 501 plus one after all. Uh, but do you like how it's, it's told in that style of a bunch of single shots? Because I'm going to be honest, I really do enjoy it. I think that every comic that has come out so far has given um, great supplemental information and has been really a compliment to the characters that we experience in the movies. So, like, I think of the Qui-Gon Jinn, number one. That was a great compliment to what we learn in the movie about Qui-Gon Jinn because we get to further see how he wasn't really on the same page with the Jedi Council, how there was some conflict there. He got mentoring from Yoda. I also like that, that Yoda in several of these comics has played, uh, like, a cameo role and offered some mentorship, so that's pretty cool. Um, but I think about the Obi-Wan too. Like the Obi-Wan single shot was like uh, Attack of the Clones era. Uh, it was before Attack of the Clones because uh, he was a, a younger Anakin, but you're seeing like Anakin in the class with kids that are four years younger than him and he's so much more advanced and Obi-Wan doesn't trust that, you know, Anakin is ready, which explains that elevator scene in Attack of the Clones. Like I cannot stand Obi-Wan talking down to Anakin, but it further explains Obi-Wan just really wasn't confident in his ability to be a mentor. And, you know, we just see these great moments time and time after again with these single shots that further the su- further support, further explain what we see in the movies. And I just love that. I'm obsessed with that, and I want to get your take on it. Let me know down in the comments below. Now, next thing we're going to talk about is Age of Rebellion. These are the next comics that are set out uh, to drop. This is around April uh, that we're going to see these comics. And uh, I've got them pulled up here. we got story starring Leia, Tarkin, and uh, a few other characters Marvel's Age of Rebellion, according to StarWars.com, a special series of one-shots written by Greg Pak, will celebrate rebel princess Jedi Masters and more legendary heroes and villains from the time of the Galactic Civil War. While the series doesn't launch until April, StarWars.com uh, did offer us our first look at the title series. So you have Princess Leia, which is pretty cool. Uh, this is with art by Chris Sprouse. This is April 3rd, set following the events of Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back. The story tells of how Leia prepares for the rescue of Han Solo by taking on the identity of bounty hunter Bush and uh, must earn the trust of Bosk. So this is interesting to me because we got this kind of with the forces of destiny. Uh, Leia was running around in that Bush. Um, I'm saying Bush because I think that's how you say the character's name. But, uh, you know, she's in the outfit and Maz Kanata is somehow there helping her out. So I'll be interested if that is all referenced or if this is like the actual canon take. The Force of the Destiny isn't actually meant to be taken as the literal canon. I'm curious to find that out, but this is definitely a moment where I'm fascinated. And, of course, we know because we watched Solo, A Star Wars Story, because it's a good movie, 
Uh, we know how Lando already had his bounty hunter costume for, uh, you know, infiltrating Jabba's palace in Return of the Jedi. So really excited to see what we get here with Leia in her single shot. Next up, we have Grand Moff Tarkin illustrated by Mark Lamming. This hit shelves April 10th and explores how the Imperial Mastermind ensures that the Death Star will live up to its name. Maybe we go back to Scarif. That's always fun. Um, but if you know, uh, if you've read the Tarkin novel, you know that there's a few options of where we could be going. I would love some further exploration of like the beginning stages of the Death, of the Death Star, like that story where there's like millions of Geonosians and they all commit mutiny on the Death Star and it kind of explodes the facility or at least the progress that had been built, and so they kind of have to like start all over. I think that would be fun because that's basically what leads to the uh, genocide of the Geonosians. Um, but anyways, really excited for Grand Moff Tarkin. We have Age of Rebellion. This is the special. You have Biggs, and you have uh, <laughs> you have Porkins, uh, and it looks like you have IG-88. I mean, that's what I'm assuming. Yeah, and that's a fair assumption because that's what it's in the uh, description that I'm about to read to you. Uh, but this comes out April 10th, so the day after my birthday. My birthday is April 9th, in case anybody is curious. This comes out April 10th, and this features three stories starring characters both iconic and lesser known. This is writer C. Superior and artist Casper Winnegard. We talked about him. He had a role in the Age of uh, Republic special he just reviewed. And they tell the story of uh, the droid bounty hunter IG-88, a Yoda story set during the Jedi Master's exile on Dagobah. That sounds great. That comes from writer Mark Gungenheim and artist Andrea Barcoda. Uh, Barcodo, rather. The writer-artist John Adams focuses on Rebel Pilots, Biggs Darklighter, and Jack Porkins. That is going to be hands down everyone's favorite. There's not a doubt. I mean, I am excited for Yoda on Dagobah, but you, there's an, a Porkins comic book? Are you kidding me? Like, 2019 is the year of Star Wars. You're getting Episode Nine, that wrap of the saga. You're getting The Mandalorian. Clone Wars has returned, and you're getting Jack Porkins in a comic book. You best consider yourself blessed or very thankful based on your religious beliefs or none of. All right, so back to the comics here. Star Wars Rebellion, Age of Rebellion, Darth Vader, covered by Terry and Rachel Dodson. This is beautiful. This is, this is something that I would get blown up and put on my wall. This is the second of three series exploring different eras of the, uh, the prequel-centric Age of Republic that's in stores now. The sequel trilogy focused on Age of Resistance will follow up later this year, by the way. But Age of Rebellion continues. Uh, even more issues. Han Solo, Boba Fett, Lando Calrissian, Jabba the Hutt. They arrive in May. Luke Skywalker, number one. Darth Vader, number one. Join us in June. So, of course, you want to stay up to date with all those comics, uh, whether that is um, those comics for uh, the near future Months from now, stay up to date with us. Also, I'm sure that uh, StarWars.com will drop more goodness as time goes on. But uh, just want to say thank you so much for uh, joining me to make Episode 2 of Beyond the Panel really special. Before we go, I do want to flash up there the comic that we're getting next week. So not a busy week when it comes to Star Wars. We're getting Star Wars number 60. With one variant cover, this is the uh, John Christopher Taylor uh, action figure variant. Uh, so that's pretty cool. You get Akbar, um, but excited to read this. Of course, we know that Kill, uh, uh, Killian Garen is is done with this run. I believe sixty seven or sixty nine is her last issue writing. She says that you know everything that she's wanted to write about these characters in this era, uh, she thinks she's she's been able to do, and so she wants new projects. And so, fingers crossed. I would totally dig Charles Soule taking over the Star Wars run after Gillian. It, it would make sense. Like, Kieran's done a great job with the series, and I thought uh, Aaron did a great job kicking this thing off. But Charles Soule has kind of proven himself, if Claudia Gray, if Claudia Gray is the best canon novel writer right now in Star Wars, which I think you can easily make the argument, We'll see what E.K. Johnson does with her Padme novel. Um, but then again, Claudia Gray is coming out with her Master and Apprentice, Obi-Wan Kenobi, uh, Qui-Gon Jinn novel. So, I mean, I still don't think it's going to be close. Um, you can make the argument for Chuck Wendig, I guess, but he's not really involved with the writing for Star Wars, at least from what I can tell right now, having been fired from Marvel. My point is, 
Claudia Gray to me is the best novel writer. She could write a Star Wars movie. I think it would be exceptionally ri- well written and would convey well with the fans. The, cl- the comic book equivalent to me is Charles Soule. Charles Soule took the second run of Darth Vader when everyone was like, oh, we're getting another Darth Vader after the first one. Meanwhile, a lot more fans, I think, were like, oh, yeah, we want more Vader. Like, all the Vader will take it. Which might explain why we're getting Dark Visions in, in, in March, rather, uh, because people like Vader, and Vader sells. Every issue hit, you've heard me say this time and time again on the main live show, is that every issue of Charles Soule's comic hit, complemented by the great artwork of Giuseppe Camincoli, the Italian, um, my, my fellow paisan, I would love to see what Charles can do with this comic, and I think Engel is doing a great job with the art, no offense, I'd say bring Giuseppe over and they tag team that main line for a couple of years and give us some really fun adventures because Charles Soule and Giuseppe telling stories post Empire Strikes Back in comic form, in comic form rather, could be dark. It could be intense. We can show the development of U- of Luke coming into himself using the Force because right now he's on this farm like planet. And he barely knows how to stand with a lightsaber in his hands. The power is just overwhelming him uh, in his grasp. You know, how does he get to the point where he's at least calm enough to get the saber hilt out of the snow? Where he's able to hold his own against Vader. Now, of course, we know that Vader is toying with Luke that whole battle. But the point is, I want to see Charles explore the sun now. He's had fun with the formative years of Vader. Let's let Charles have the formative years of Luke as a Jedi in training. And then let's see what's going on with Han and Leia. I talked about this on uh, the live show this past... Um, we did a Monday morning because the weather delayed us. I couldn't get David and Jesse over, so I ended up pushing the episode a day. Did it live Monday morning. Check it out if you haven't already. I brought this up. It's like, I want to see in comic book form Han Solo run into that bounty hunter and Or Mandel. Like, I want that story in comic book. Uh, I guess they could do it in a novel, but I want to see it. I want to see it play out. And Charles Soule doing that, writing that story with Giuseppe doing the art, would be exceptional. And here's my money. I'm buying three copies. And if there's any like really sweet variants, you're taking my money. I'm going to do it as well. Because I just think that Charles Soule writes, and ha- he writes great Star Wars, but he just knows Star Wars stories that work. You know, like Dave Filoni was able to pull off like, the world between worlds thing in Star Wars Rebels, which is basically, it's kind of like time travel, but it's not, but it kind of is. He made it work. It, it ticked off fans, but it, anything you do, there any art that you create, like there's going to be people who love it and there's going to be people who hate it. Charles Soule, in his comic book, put a kyber crystal Jedi blaster cannon weapon in his comic book that Jocasta New fires. Okay. This looks ridiculous. It looks like a weapon that probably lived in like the old Republic era, but it just looks ridiculous. The sound of it is ridiculous. It worked. It worked. Fans were cool with it. You know, we're still like curious, like why the Jedi would have a, a blaster like that because it's so uncivilized, right, for the Jedi to use a blaster. And I feel like if uh, the Clone Wars might have been over a lot faster if the Jedi were out there with uh, Kyber crystal fueled blasters. That's just me. It worked. It still worked. Charles Soule writes concise, tight stories. Great imagery with the words, always complimented by a strong artist. I think it'd be a lot of fun to have a two-year run with Charles Soule on the main Star Wars line. What do you think about that idea? Am I crazy? Do you agree with me? That'd be kind of cool if we were on the same page. Let me know down in the comments below. And with that said, it is the end of Episode 2 of Beyond the Panel. Thank you so much for making this so fun, and thanks for engaging me with uh, engaging with me in the chat, in the comments below. It is so important that we continue our conversation, our Star Wars conversation, after the blast doors close. And so I look forward to doing that with you in the comments below. Again, let me know what you think about these comics that we got this week, what we're going to have with the Age of Rebellion comics. Let me know about my Charles Soul idea, taking over Star Wars, uh, the main line. And of course, if you like these, if you like this show. And ideas of how you'd like to see it grow over time. I always love constructive feedback. All right, that's going to do it for me. 
episode two, Beyond the Panel. It's out. Make sure you join me this Sunday with Jesse and David for episode 55 of Beyond the Blast Doors Live. We are talking about, uh, we'll talk about these comics. We'll get their take on them. Uh, but we also have some episode nine production updates. Also the latest uh, with Star Wars Resistance, a new episode dropping Sunday night. We also got uh, some more news on the Star Wars Lego sets or Lego Star Wars sets that are set to drop in April. So we'll have all that and more when you join us on Sunday for BTBD Live, episode 55. We'll see you soon. May the Force be with you. Thank you for watching Beyond the Blast Doors. Be sure to subscribe to our channel. Don't forget, give us a thumbs up and leave a comment. Beyond the Blast Doors, a Star Wars conversation.